we uh, have uh, the wonderful Rebecca Priest, who's a project coach with the Greenhouse Project, um, who will uh, talk about uh, more about uh, greenhouses, but also her experiences as an operator, and can also share with us some of um, some of the aspects of that universal worker model. Um, but we are also thrilled uh, to have as our moderator of this discussion um, the wonderful Assemblywoman Angela V. McKnight. Um, Uh, who was first elected as the first African-American Assemblywoman from the 31st District of the great state of New Jersey in the legislature in 2015. Uh, she is now serving in her fourth term, um, and she is a Democratic lawmaker representing towns in Hudson County, New Jersey, including Bayonne and Jersey City. Uh, as a member of the General Assembly, Assemblywoman McKnight is the chairwoman of the Aging and Senior Services Committee, um, so uh, a very important voice to have in our program this morning. Um, she is also vice chair of the Women and Children's Committee and a member of the Homeland Security and State Preparedness Committee. In addition, Assemblywoman McKnight is a deputy majority leader in our assembly. But she comes to this role with a lot of experience. She is also the founder and chief executive officer of Angela Cares, an advocacy and support organization for senior citizens, senior caregivers, and youth based in Jersey City. She's an entrepreneur running a, a few businesses and a self-published author, another very busy woman. <laughs> She is an advocate for senior care, social justice, and cultural fairness in black communities, as well as, women, health, as women's health amongst a plethora of important matters affecting New Jerseyans. As a mentor and educator, Assemblywoman McKnight also serves as an adjunct faculty member, I told you she was busy, at New Jersey City University and as an instructor at the Rising Tide Capital Community Business Academy. She holds a BS in business management from the University of Phoenix and has 30 years of experience in the customer service and technology areas. As an activist and social advocate, Assemblywoman McKnight serves as a board member on several boards to include the Jersey City Community Charter School, the United Way of Hudson County, Alliance Community Healthcare, I Love Greenville, and the NJCU Health Sciences Undergraduate and Keys Red Door Realty and Associates Advisory Boards. She is the chair of New Jersey Black Legislative Caucus Foundation and the president of the Hudson County Black Caucus. She has received several honors for her advocacy and accomplishments to include, but not limited, to the US Senator Robert Menendez 2019 Community Outreach Award and the 2022 Community Impact Award from Trinity Faith Church of the Living God. Wow. Um, Angela resides in her hometown of Jersey City. She is married to her high school sweetheart, Anthony McKnight Sr., and they have two children, Anaja, 29, and an Anthony Jr., 21, as well as an amazing four-year-old grandson named Jordan. Thank you so much, Chairwoman McKnight, for being here. Um, please, Rebecca and Assemblywoman McKnight, take the stage. Morning. Every time I hear someone read my bio, I'm like, wow, that's me? <laughs> that's why you're so tired. <laughs> I know, right? But I get my strength through the Lord, so everything I do is through him. So thank you so much to AARP. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. Rebecca, it's an honor to meet you. I am not going to read your bio. I want you to tell everyone in your own words about you. I love who you are. 
I see that you have over 20 years experience working in the senior community, but I would love for you to tell everyone who you are and why you're here with us today. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Can I, I have a whole preparation for today and after listening to you talk, Susan, I just wanna throw it out. Like, let's talk about scalabilities, guys. Cause I can, we can do this. New Jersey can absolutely do this. Uh, my name is Rebecca Priest. I'm so happy to be with you all today and thank you for moderating with me. Uh, I started my career in long-term care when I was um, probably about 12. My mother was a director of nursing at a traditional organization. However, I've lived in long-term care actually for much longer than that. I was telling Mary, uh, I have a sister who has pervasive developmental disorder and autism, and we've always talked as a family about her journey into a long-term care setting. Uh, so walking into a nursing home with my mom, I said, well, this isn't what we're talking about for my sister. And she said, nope, it's not. And I said, well, why not? And she said, because it's different. And I said, well, why? And here I am at 41 years old, still going, well, why is it different? Um, and how can we learn from what New York State, which is where I'm from, has done for people with ID and DD um, to really capitalize and scale on a better quality care of care, a lower cost per person day system um, that people actually want to work in. So that's kind of my initial foyer into the industry when I graduated with my master's in business administration and social work from the University of Buffalo. Go Bills. <laughs> Nobody? Okay. Um, so you all are Giants fans, right? They're all right. Um, I remember that Super Bowl, guys. So, um, <laughs> Rebecca, I'm a Giants fan. Well, and <laughs> lucky you. <laughs> uh, so uh, once I graduated with my master's, I uh, sought an organization that was doing something different. I knew I wanted to work in long-term care. Uh, I knew I wanted to help shift a broken system into something healthier. Um, and I got hired by an organization uh, as a social worker on a rehab floor and they were doing, Susan mentioned, the Eden Alternative. And they also had in their trajectory a plan to open greenhouse homes. I knew what those homes looked like. I knew what they felt like. I knew what the staffing plan looked like. I did not get the long-term care reg regu <laughs> regulation structure. Um, so I learned baptism by fire on um, building new construction off campus in a new organization, having to create a new organization because our Department of Health um, was not able to conceptualize surveying a separate organization in long-term care, even though hundreds of providers across the nation are doing that for people with IDDD, and they're surveying them. So uh, I learned how to really listen and kind of say, okay, we have to do it this way and we have to build it this way in order to um, have an effective model. Uh, those organizations I'll share with you a little bit today. I'm so sad Lisanne is not here to share her journey. Um, but they opened in 2012. They're, tw they're 10 years old, uh, and they are pe performing incredibly. Since the pandemic started, they have had two cases of COVID, no deaths. Um, and that is not by accident. That is by a really close and consistent staff who really were all hired to that organization and trained, many of them trained by me. Um, so we, we really worked together to create something special. Uh, and 10 years later, I'm really proud as someone who volunteers at that organization now to go and see what they've done. So I'm eager to share with you great successes today. I serve as the chair of Heritage Christian Services. It's a large organization providing care for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and I've been really uh, pleased to join the Greenhouse Project. So thank you for having me. Wow, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. To the commissioner, thank you so much for opening up. Stephanie, thank you. And I love the fact that what you said about choices. This is what we need to have, choices. I used to take care of my grandmother. Um, she's my angel, my uncle, my dad, they're all my angels. And when my grandmother got sick, she was living in a senior home and she did not want to go to a nursing home. So we transformed her apartment so that she can stay there and she passed peacefully in her home about seven months later. My uncle, he also lived in a senior home and he got very, very ill and I had to put him inside of a nursing home. And my dad 
Um, he was living in, on his own, and I had to bring him back from North Carolina to New Jersey to care for him, and I put him in an assistant living, and um, eventually he went to a nursing home and he had to pass, he passed away. And I say that to say that I know about assistant livings, I know about changing your home to become a nursing home, and I know about nursing homes. And I, I'm so eager to learn about green, green homes because we have to have choices. We have to have options for our loved ones. And not every option is good for everyone, but an option is good for everyone, right? So I'm so, so um, elated to be here with you to learn about the perspectives of green homes because I want New Jersey to not be a follower. I want us to be a leader in this, right? The aging population, they're growing and they are living longer, right? My dad passed away at 95. So there are many people who are in their 90s and they're still living and they don't want to be institutionalized. They wanna be able to live like they normally would. Right? So my, with my grandmother, I had to right-size her apartment. And with these green homes, and I know you're going to share because I have some beautiful questions for you, that is part of right-sizing, right? It's giving them what they need at their age. When you grow up, you, you live in a home with your parents, you probably have to share a room with a sibling, then you go to college and you have to share a room with, um, with fellow students, or you can get a single room, then you grow up and you buy your own home, right? You, you gather all of these options and all these things in your home, and then as you grow and you get older, you have to downsize, and I, now I call it right-sizing and you may have to go into a senior home, but many people want to stay in their home that they have built, right? 30 years, they paid a mortgage, and they want to stay in their home. But many times we can't allow them to stay in their home because of the safety, because of the finances, right? When you're working, you're making a lot of money and you can sustain a home, but when you get older, your income freeze. It becomes what it is, but your bills continue to grow. So many people have to put their loved ones in a nursing home or bring them to their home to care for them. But these green homes, what I've learned, they, it's an option. And it's an option to allow our seniors to live with dignity and to feel like they're not being thrown away. So, right? Yeah, so <laughs> I know there are providers here who are thinking I cannot afford to rebuild or even do anything dramatic. Um, I understand that as someone who operated an organization in downtown Rochester on a postage size land lot with 500 people living there um, in skilled nursing. It was a big organization. Um, and similarly, we couldn't afford to build enough houses for people. So today, one of the things I hope to share with you is really about what else creates the experience of home that you can do um, and that the, commission, uh, the commissioner and the Department of Health can really help to um, pave roads in, to push providers to think outside of the box without having to make them do mental gymnastics to meet the regs. Um, because that is the reality. We are asking providers to be exorbitantly creative um, while they are also exorbitantly overwhelmed, even just meeting today's needs. So really looking at what are some realistic things that we can do. All right, so let's jump right into All it. Right. What is your perspective? on green homes. My perspective on greenhouse homes. Well, listen, we talk about greenhouse homes. It's a brand name, right, for a model of small homes. I'll tell you what I think the difference is, uh, is that the greenhouse homes funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation originally, born of the Eden Alternative, uh, which Susan kind of Rec, uh, reminded us all, um, they've been collecting data in what they're doing annually with every organization that's working with them for the last 15 years. Um, so really what the difference is, is that they're, they know some of the things that help these houses become successful beyond the physical structure. I would tell you, I think the physical structure is probably the least important thing. I'll say it again. I think the physical structure is the least important thing. 
I think the components of keeping um, entities small, so creating a, um, an ownership base that is small and accessible, I think being honest about what it takes to staff that um, with, with CNAs who are properly trained um, so that they can be successful and proud and feel like they've made a difference instead of feeling like they are handcuffed by a system of institutionalization uh, is vital. And I think an ongoing quality assurance component uh, are the three big things that this model has when I was a provider, it was what was helpful to me to say, okay, am I doing this versus am I creating a mini institution in a house? People can have institutionalization in their own home, right? Um, this is a paternalistic society we live in. We love to sue each other for everything we can. Everyone is risk adverse and living for most of us, at least I'll speak for me, but I suspect I might see some heads nod in here. It's risky. Look, I drive five hours by myself. We, will we let elders do that? Well, let isn't really, a, it's not a paradigm. If we have a valid driving, driver's license in this country, we can go where we want to go, um, right? So when we talk about the risk of living, um, ways to help organizations manage that for dignity, it's a human rights issue for me. Yeah. Okay, so I see you holding that clicker. It's, it's like a comfort thing. Okay. Like a pastor in a pulpit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what is the most rewarding feeling of being in a green home? Well, I can give you different, I can give you different perspectives, but I'll tell you, I like to tell stories. Um, so uh, I'll tell you a story about Lou, who moved into our greenhouse homes. He comes up in a lot of greenhouse stories. Uh, he was a guy who lived with di diabetes, had a bilateral lateral amputation, um, and really thought, this is it, guys. I'm... I got nothing quality-wise um, going for him. Living in a traditional organization, he struggled. Uh, it was a high-rise with 470 other people, and he lived on a home or a floor with 39 others in a semi-private room. And uh, he just really kind of caved into himself. Um, and the staff who worked with him didn't really know him at all. Um, we'll see a video about someone with a similar story. It wasn't that they didn't know him because they didn't care. It was that they didn't know him because they pop in and out. Uh, we talk about infection control. Did you know that the average nursing home person engages with 25 different human beings a day who are staff members? Dining support, housekeeping support, therapists, um, occupational therapists, nurses, different CNAs, whoever might be walking by when their call light's on, 24. Um, so it's hard to get to know people. And if you're an elder, it's hard to share your story with that many people. Who, who wants to share their story that many times? I don't. Um, so we moved into the greenhouse homes. And first thing we did was talk about access because access is really important. He got a motorized chair that really gave him um, freedom in our community. And he started rolling about the neighborhood and met neighbors who lived in the community. Uh, one day, Lou didn't come back from his, his daily roll, and we got a little nervous. So the Shabazim did what any good Shabazim would do. They went out walking to look for him on his route, and guess where they found him? In the garage of a neighbor, playing poker. <laughs> Love it. So Lou had friends that lived in the neighborhood where he lived receiving long-term care. Now we had to build in some structure so that, you know, that was something that people knew he liked to do. We had to give him a way to contact us to say, hey guys, I'm going to be out a little longer than I thought. Um, but when you look at someone, especially an adult, who's had in many ways their freedoms restricted by no fault of their own, but by their physical or cognitive changes, um, and you see those those freedoms kind of reinstated, it's a pretty amazing feeling. And the staff wrapping around him getting pumped to go like, oh, Lou, you like Texas Hold'em. Uh, you know, like to really think about that, uh, it's pretty magical. Awesome, so let's flip it. What is the most rewarding um, thing for a worker to work inside of a greenhouse home? Mm -hmm. So Annette, who I just had the pleasure of reconnecting with, uh, was one of my original hires. She'll tell people I didn't want to hire her, she's right. Um, but I was wrong. She was, she was a great hire. And uh, she, at the traditional organization, was a housekeeper. And she loves cooking. And she wanted to cook a meal for an elder that lived on the 
unit that she was working on. And the nurse manager said, why would you ever do that? And she felt like she shouldn't do it. And she was kind of like, I'm not going to do it. Um, Annette will tell you, and many people, that one of the greatest rewards for her is being able to, at 1 o'clock in the morning, make clams and linguine for someone who loves them, um, or to order from grocery stores down the street uh, the right ice cream that someone really cares about. She says, I feel like I'm uncuffed to meet the expectations and desires of the people who I love. And that's a great, a great thing to hear. Wow. So you're a project coach. Yes, a greenhouse project coach. Yes. So can you share an experience that have touched you while working as a project coach? So many. Uh, so a greenhouse project coach is work with organizations uh, to work through the greenhouse model of transition. Some of those people are building new construction. Others are trying to transform their existing organizations. It's nice for me to come on as a project coach because I got to do it. You know, so, I mean, I, I, I lived it um, and operated for seven great years um, and, and still keep in touch with that organization. Um, so I think one of the most rewarding things, honestly, is when it's going to be, and there's only a couple of you nurses in here, but it's going to be a nursing story. Nurses are kind of set in their ways. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> look, my mom's one, so it goes deep, right? It's a little Freudian. Um, <laughs> But, but nurses uh, often have a sense of what is possible and what is not possible. And I don't think there's anything that beats ha having a nurse say to me, Rebecca, I never thought that we would be able to meet the needs of someone who was so, insert word here, so sick, so confused, so disabled in a model that wasn't looking like a hospital. I never thought we could do it. And then they do it and they go, it's so much better. And that's really rewarding. Yeah. So Susan brought up um, working the staff, right, the staffers. So can you elaborate on the difference of working in a greenhouse home versus a traditional nursing home? Sure. And it depends on the organization. I think that's really important. Sometimes people hear the greenhouse name and they think super prescriptive, um, outside of my scope, super expensive. I just want you to know it's, it's a lot more nimble um, than it was 10 years ago, mostly because we've learned. Like, there's a reality that has to be worked with in. Um, so the experience of the staff, is that what you told me, yes. asked me about? Mm -hmm. And uh, and what happens? That universal care worker, and the commissioner said, New Jersey is a um, SEIU state, a, a labor union state. I want you to know I'm going to share with you a story about Leonard Florence, um, which is in Chelsea, Mass. They are also SEIU. I'm working with a project in Martha's Vineyard that is also going to be a unionized project. The labor unions are excited about a versatile worker model. And let me tell you why. Because... It is a model that is rooted in empowerment and not buzzword empowerment. Empowerment in terms of we give you the skills and the training and the support and the structure. It's an operational structure that allows you and really encourages you to take care of people wholly, but not 12 of them, not 20 of them, three, maybe five, right? So this is where the unions go, oh, Okay, now we're talking. You're talking about staffing me appropriately for what you're asking me to do, and you're talking about training me appropriately for what you're asking me to do. We don't have to build the trainings, all right? Y'all, they're, they're out there, right? Whether they're through a, a branded project, or they're through Action Pact, or they're through a, the Department of Health. There is enough out there. It is a matter of funding organizations to be able to train their employees and I would say tr funding employees give reimbursement to employees that are taking trainings and getting certifications um, in person directed care in, in those areas and that's where that universal worker um, starts to become a career path that's not a uh, perfunctory or a um, what's it like a, a false you know, we call, in, in IDDD, we call it direct support professionals, and I always go, make it professional. I don't want to hear it if it's not a real professional role. So we're talking about authentically upskilling direct care because, quite frankly, it's gotten a whole lot more complex in the last 25 years. 
So what about the work schedule, the shifts? Can you talk about that? The greenhouse model uh, really com has components of quality assurance within it, whereby that team starts to manage the functions of their team themselves. So there's someone who coordinates dining and makes sure that is meeting quality assurance expectations. There's someone who oversees housekeeping and makes sure that's meeting expectations, at meaningful life or activities, um, and make sure that's meeting expectations. And there's someone who oversees scheduling. It's called a scheduling coordinator. It's the most uh, loathed and loved coordinator role of direct care staff, because truly it's hard to staff 24 hours. And any of us who've taken care of loved ones know that, right? Um, but the neat part about the, the staffing model and the philosophy of Greenhouse, um, when it's done right by an organization, it really affords those people taking care of the people in the house the flexibility to say, you know what, we do not need three people starting at 7A. We need one person starting at 7A because most of our house doesn't start waking up until 10. So we're going to have one person who comes in at 7A, they're going to work 7 to 3. We're going to have two people who come in at 9, and 9 to 5 is going to be that shift. And guess what? Someone new moves in the house, and they like to get up, they're me, they like to get up at 4 in the morning. All of a sudden, we need to shift again. But the model comes back to the people who work in the house to say, how do we need the meet, meet the needs of the people who live there and each other? So would you say that it's a positive work environment? Oh my gosh, way more positive. Is that an way more positive. And it's not perfect, right? Because we're talking about deep-rooted, um, you know, CNA history in this country is, is rooted in oppressive p policies and practices. We have a huge immigrant population who maybe English is not their first language. So it's rooted, rooted in all the isms, right? And quite frankly, those CNA workforce is getting older. So now we can add that, a that ism to the workforce. Um, but on the whole, a model that really takes into account who we are as humans, um, again, it's all, for me, it comes back to like, are we honoring human growth? And the greenhouse model is about human growth, not just for the elders, but really for those who take care of them. It's paramount. Yeah. Awesome. What is your relationship with the residents um, in the greenhouse homes? Well, now my relationship is to really try and pick their brains for how are things going and how can it improve. Um, this is a, f a fun little story for all you operators out there. For those people who move in from a traditional organization to a greenhouse home that structurally looks different, mm -hmm. it's like moving into the mansion. Like it's like, oh, right, I got my own room, I got a hearth with this amazing open kitchen, it's all new and glamorous. Uh, for those people who've never lived in a traditional organization, moving into a house with nine other elders who need care, your expectations, they're higher. So we have to continue to grow and elevate the model. Um, so it's really, I think the greenhouse model is not just not looking about what's the place that people age in, but it's really looking at how do you build an operational structure that's nimble enough to respond to individuals. Because quite frankly, my desires are going to be way different than yours. My story is going to be way different than yours. And I, when, I'm going to want you to be able to meet me where you're at. Uh, you're going to want to go to your church and your community, right? I'm going to want to go to my YMCA where I worked out before. Even though I need long-term care, I want that membership. Make it happen. So really we're talking about how do we grow an operational system and structure that can really empower those people. So, you know, we have the PACE programs here um, in New Jersey, and I love them. And you have the, the seniors or the residents who go, they get picked up, and they, they're there, and they get breakfast, and they get lunch, and they also provide services in the home. What services are provided inside of the greenhouse homes? all of them. So you can get therapy, you can get medical care, you can get your medication and meals, you get housekeeping and laundry, you get meaningful things to do with your days. Um, and ideally in a greenhouse home, you're getting ways to continue meaningful engagements with the people that you love. So ways to support your family either coming or you getting to them. Uh, a guy, Don, who lived in, a, in one of the houses that I worked at, um, lived with advanced dementia and screamed every single day, every single hour, living in a traditional organization, and um, never got out of bed, actually. 
When he moved into the greenhouse home, it took a couple of days, uh, but he looked at the dining room table and he said, I gotta go eat dinner. I said, of course you do, let's go. He gets there, he gets up out of his wheelchair. We're all like, what is going on? Two people right next to him. And he stands and he transfers into a chair. He sits at the table with nine other people and the staff who are supporting them, and he eats dinner. Um, and then he says, you know, I gotta go back to my cabin. Nobody knew about his cabin. His wife came in often, Barb, and we said, Barb, Don was telling us about a cabin. She goes, ah, oh, we have one on Cuca Lake. And we said, do you go there still? She said, oh yeah, the whole family goes every weekend pretty much for this period. Should we bring Don? She's like, you can't bring Don there. We said, we would help. We, we can come and send a staff along. She said, that's insane. Let's try it. We did. <laughs> Let me tell you, Don went to the cabin every single month until the end of his life. He also told the Shabazim how to get there. A man with advanced dementia told her, here's where you turn, this way, that way. What do you think that Shabazim's experience of Don was after that? She was, I mean, her mind was blown that within this brain that otherwise was expressing by screaming or very minimal traditional communication paths was the ability to remember how to get to a cabin an hour away. She looked at him like he was a whole human again. That's what the greenhouse model is about, right? It's about instilling in staff, you are a whole human and you deserve the love and care and respect to have a successful workplace first and foremost and the people that you're supporting are whole humans and they deserve a place where they can live a meaningful life every day yeah wow, thank you how is the relationship amongst the residents and the greenhouse it's office? honest <laughs> uh, so um, it's funny it, it depends right uh, I mean most of us went to college or lived in a community setting at some point, there are people you gelled with and there are people that you aren't. Most of the time, the greenhouse has enough flexibility to say, you know what, Robert and Rebecca, don't sit them next to each other at the table. But they each have their own room and they each know each other and they can regard each other. But maybe Rebecca spends most of her time in the backyard and Robert's a front porch kind of guy. Um, so it, it, it People kind of say, like, what happens? Well, and I say, well, what happens when you're living with 39 other people on a floor in a traditional organization, right? So human beings together, it's always going to be a challenge. Um, but I think the model's flexible enough to be able to meet the need. And again, it trains the staff well enough to be able to go, let's creatively solution for this. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the training for the staff. Um, you said that there could be some models that you can bring in. Um, and you, you also mentioned that you, you talk to the residents about their, their stay and how everyone's treating them. So can you talk a little bit more about the training for the staff? Sure. So um, this is one of the things that when providers hear this, they go, oh, it can't happen, right? It will never work. But I want you to know it can work. It just doesn't have to happen all at once. It's not like you have to pull people for three full weeks to do 120 hours of training, okay? There's ways to really do this whereby your training is it, it's um, embedded in the work that you do. I would love to see academics embed the training in CNA care. So CNA training is what, 144 hours? If CNA training took care of a broader basis of support, um, whereby it really talked to best case support of people with dementia, interpersonal skills, conflict resolution skills, family communication skills, kind of the core elements that most um, organizations are really looking at. If, if CNA training had those embedded, the result of care would be improved. Again, I think that's something that, that New Jersey could do. They could lead shifting the curriculum. It doesn't mean create a new one. It's already out there. Do you hear me saying like, we don't need to create anything else. There's so much out there. We just have to embed it within what we're doing. Or meaningful activities. This is the one that um, most providers look at me like I'm crazy, but look, why does meaningful activity have to be just for elders? Why can't it include the direct care staff um, and families who work with them, right? So, and why can't meaningful activity be about growing yourself? I mean, I'm all about growing. Um, and that means we spend 45 minutes talking about what makes our lives meaningful. 
that's part of the education for Greenhouse, is how do I talk to people about what makes your life meaningful? It seems so simple to us. It's not intrinsic in the model that we have right now. So you have to thoughtfully build it in. Um, but I think that there are innovative ways providers can really build into their structure education to check the boxes and get those trainings done as long as their structure then supports the empowerment that comes from it. Because there's nothing worse than telling people, listen, I want you to create some place that's really special and fun to be and that works on collaboration and elevates the emotional IQ of the people around us. But then when you try and do it, I'm going to tell you, oh, stop. Because that's enough, right? Um, and that's unfortunately one of the things that we've come up against um, in institutional culture. So would you say direct care staff are more likely to stay at the greenhouse? So the greenhouse retention for direct care staff is 75% better than across the nation. I need you to know that includes a lot of diversity. Um, I got some great pictures up here. I want to thank whoever put those up for there for me. Um, so some of the houses... This is the, this is the house I got to open. Uh, some of the houses are one-story homes. They have like a, a hearth and a dining room, right? And they're, they look like a suburban home. I've driven through New Jersey enough to, you know, you have suburbs, right? <laughs> oh. uh, but some of the houses, I'll come back to it, to that video. Some of the houses are mid-rise. So they have maybe five houses within a multi-story structure, but they have balcony space or access processes to access outside, meaning every single day we go outside and whoever wants to come comes with us, right? You don't have to be literalists about the greenhouse model. You hear me with that? There's ways to improve right now without spending money. Um, and some are high-rise organizations like Chelsea Mass or John Knox Village, Florida, um, that have actually constructed. So you go in. It, it's very New York City, I, I would imagine, although I'm not a New York City girl. Uh, you go into kind of like the main lobby of your apartment complex. There's maybe a bellman who knows the shtick, right? Uh, there's a little cafe that you can meet people down at. Maybe there's a spa where if you want to get your nails done, you can do that. And then you go up the elevator, and when you get off the elevator, you don't walk into someone's home. You see a front door. Duh. And the front door is the entrance to the house. Um, and that's, that's been really successful. Um, and again, it cultivates that sense of you're walking into a home versus you're walking into like a, sometimes I feel like we get off elevators in traditional institutions. It's like going to a, a airport a waiting room. Like everyone's just kind of sitting around waiting for something, um, but nobody really knows when it's coming. You know, so it creates that sense of I'm walking into home. So yeah. Do you want to see? Do you want to see the home? Yeah, let me see. All right, let's let watch see. it. Y'all want to see the home? I think it's gonna make me happy the rest of my life here. I think I'm, my life is much better. The same staff is here mostly every day. So we get a chance to build that strong relationship. Welcome home to the St. John's Greenhouse Home. The moment you walk in, it feels like home. Comfortable chairs and a fireplace in the family room. Cooking in the kitchen. <laughs> laughs and conversation at the dining room table. It is our family. We consider each other family. And that's the whole idea of Greenhouse, is to make it like home. Everything is cooked right here in the kitchen. <laughs> it's amazing. Each St. John's Greenhouse home is home for 10 elders and are built with all the elements needed for senior living care and support. Elders have their own individual spacious rooms with carpeting, windows, and private bathrooms. I think my bedroom is very pretty. I think it was very, very well done. I have um, all the equipment I need for uh, taking a shower or washing in any way. The biggest thing is the pace. You're not tied to when the food truck comes, when the med cart comes, I think basically we're more in tune with the elders and their, their rhythm of the day. The suburban residential setting has the look and feel of any other neighborhood home. They have a screened in porch and a beautiful backyard. 
You can take a leisurely break or do some gardening. I can get outdoors and, and see the grass and the trees. We got uh, three different kinds of beans and we're gonna let them grow up the fence. There are 10 different bird feeders and we just love to be out there. Each resident receives St. John's quality care from nurses and staff. And the space, privacy, and comforts make visiting loved ones even more special. I love your sweetheart. It's like they're going to their grandmother's house or grandfather's house, and they feel more comfortable. I entertain a lot here. I have my friends come here. It's a little bit more private, and it's and we get to meet everybody she's living with, and it's like visiting her home. And I think I love. From the staff, to friends and family, and most importantly to the elders, St. John's Greenhouse Home is truly a place to call home. Living here in the greenhouse, it's basically like you're at home. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, what didn't you see? in that house. Animals. Animals. They actually, they did get a dog at one point. One house uh, decided they wanted to adopt a dog. All the 10 elders in the house have to agree with that and they have to say, yep. All supporting of it because not everybody wants a dog. Uh, and they ended up adopting a Mastiff, a 180 pound Mastiff. I was the administrator of record, guys. Um, yeah, and uh, Lexi, her name was, and she, Honestly, she, so we worked with a rescue and the rescue knew what we were looking for. And they said, this dog is your dog. And she came and she was so chill and she was tall enough to put her head right on the laps of people who sat. Um, and she was amazing. You, you didn't see med carts. You shouldn't. You didn't see a staff break room. There isn't one. The staff can break and do take breaks, but it's a different feel. And this is where SEIU really um, kind of showed some great flexibility is instead of breaking in a staff only, there's no staff only space in a greenhouse. And this is, this is part of the physical structure that does help because it makes more sense to people, especially if you're living with dementia, that you can go in any door and mostly that you can see everything. So you can see the kitchen and you can see the living room and you can see the backyard um, or you can see the porch. Um, but you, you didn't see a staff break room you didn't see a dishwashing room. So the regulations right now want us to have a dishwashing room. It makes it challenging. You got to figure out how do we build a dishwashing room into a kitchen um, that will meet regulations. Um, you didn't see probably a lot of the hidden features that meet regulations. They asked us to add in uh, like floor lighting to show the exits about a week before we opened. It was about a $60,000 uh, renovation at the end of hoping to move people in because they wanted lighted pathways to get out of a one-story house where 10 people were living. Well, here's the deal. We can do that, and organizations can do it, but you're not going to get a lot of them because it's really expensive. So thinking about building code in a way that you could um, really kind of say, look, if you're building a, a house or a household model, you can meet this building code, not the current hospital building code that we have. You didn't see hospital beds. You actually saw full-size beds, one of the most... Uh, kind of controversial things about that build and some builds uh, is that they do not have hospital beds. They are high-low and they're full-size because guess what? Sometimes your wife or your husband want to come and they want to take a nap next to you. It is the coolest thing to see. Um, and it happened a lot. It happened a lot there. So those are some of the things I think when you're thinking about like what can we do uh, we can we can start to kind of reconceptualize the way we we work with our people who are supporting elders. I have two more questions, and I'm going to open it up. So, do you have community coming in to, you know, do activities or to interact with the residents? Great question. So, when you guys are at home, think about the things you do for fun. You read. You watch movies. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you might go out for tea with somebody. Uh, maybe you go to the YMCA if you're a big member, or uh, you like to go out to dinner. Um, do any of you play bingo? My grandma does. She goes out to bingo, but she goes to a bingo hall with human beings who live outside of institutions. Guess what? So can those houses. Um, any of you, let me think of some other good 
nursing home games. Any of you play uh, like win, lose, or draw, or watch um, game shows on the TV? Yeah, you can do that, and you can do it with your, with your peers. So no, there's no external coming in, but there is a quality assurance person in each house. It's a Shabazz. The Shabazz is a Persian word, and it means royal falcon. Um, the story is that they're, they're there to protect and sustain and nurture. There are other places that call that universal worker adarim, um, like a term, term of endearment. There are, I just talked with an organization in New Zealand. They're going to call them kipus, which means the source of compassion. I love it. Um, so it's really just about things thinking about reframing who people are. Uh, I honestly don't, it doesn't matter what you call them as long as you support them to be fully expressing their job in the way people want to. And they, they want to express their job in a way that takes care of people. I've seen it way more times than not. Thank you. So what is the most important thing that you want all of us in this room to take away? I think scalability really starts with a government um, shifting funding to say, listen, we're going to support education for direct care staff. Uh, I think as an operator, that is one of the most difficult things, is how do you get staff trained if you're not getting compensated for it? So I think there's two pathways. One is fund the direct care staff and say, listen, we're going to pay you $1,000 to take this class. I'm in. And pay the provider that's making it happen for them and say, we will give you a rate adjustment or a, um, a compensation structure for doing these trainings with your direct care staff. When you educate people, <laughs> go figure, they grow. Uh, when you don't, it's not a good system. So that's one thing. The other is to know that there are organizations like mine and others um, that are really there to help do the creative stuff to help with the uh, current regulatory jumps that have to be done. And there are a lot of departments of health that are saying, we want this, we'll help work with you. Um, I see that more often than not, is that departments want to help and they're willing to, to support creativity and design. Um, and, and finally, the last thing is that if you're not in a place where you can build, um, there's, there is no excuse not to do something different and blended roles with the right training and support is a great place where you can decrease the amount of and number of humans engaged in those elders' lives, but really grow uh, the depth of relationship that those care partners are experiencing. Thank you. So I wanna open it up. Does anyone have any questions for Rebecca? Um, uh, obvious problem for many uh, people facing, you know, being put in a nursing home is, waiting lists and costs. So can you talk about that? How long would it take to get into a home and what the costs would be? Such a great question. So one of the challenges right now is that there's just not enough, right, of these. There's 300 and, I think she said 371 buildings. Um, Arkansas is building 17 right now as we speak. There's more coming, uh, but it's not near enough, right? right. Um, so I think that that's a very real challenge. Uh, that said, occupancy in greenhouse homes uh, over the pandemic has hovered right around, and Robert will speak to this a bit, right around 93%. Um, before then, they were 99% occupied. And we're talking about all ventures, VA-sponsored ventures, government-sponsored greenhouse homes, and privatized or not-for-profit industry. Uh, those homes have been 100% occupied since the day they opened. Uh, they serve 50% people who are Medicaid and 50% of people who are privately paying. Um, and they cost on average around $8 less per day than the traditional model. Um, and I know that because we got to run both. So it was like this nice little an analysis that we got to do. Uh, across the nation, we find food costs per person reduced tremendously in this model because there's not as much waste, because it's a more customized meal experience. We also find the clinical outcomes of weight, stability, skin integrity, um, far less pressing issues than we do in traditional organizations. You know when people have eaten and drink when, drink when there's only nine of them. Um, so I do think waiting list is an ongoing challenge, and I think most organizations who have them have some sort of waiting list. The cost to people per day, um, if you're privately paying, tends to be an upcharge for most organizations. But if you are someone who is um, receiving Medicaid services or qualified for Medicaid services, most of our providers, not all of them, but most of them have a hybrid model where they're trying to meet a mission. And they're doing it really well. Uh, 
Um, so I really do admire this model because not only does it empower the individual and their identity, but it also creates a sense of community. And when I do think of community, I also think of a person's language, their culture, um, their religion, spirituality. So I was wondering how does the greenhouse model accommodate and empower for people to practice these things really? Such a great question. Um, I, there, there is a video, and I think we'll probably send out slides so you can see, but um, Leonard Florence in Chelsea, Mass, has a high rise where they have three houses dedicated to all people on ventilators living with ALS. Uh, so they have a community of people who are grieving together. It's really real. It's not, it's not a tract. I mean, it, it's not a sexy thing to have ALS, right? Um, but it's sure nice to have it with other people who are walking through that journey with you and living really awesome lives, going to Celtics games and all that stuff. Um, so when you talk about like other communities, I think there's great possibility, right? So we had talked to organizations that were considering doing a home for all ASL and hearing impaired uh, people, or if there are community sponsored initiatives. So the project on Martha's Vineyard, um, is a, a project that is upwelling from the community. And these grassroots organizations, they're hardcore. If the, if the Department of Health can really elevate grants to, um, to community-based organizations, church organizations, I think some really innovative things can happen in small scale. I stayed here last night and I was looking at the Performing Arts Center across the way. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool? I th it looks like there's some sort of housing in there. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if the first floor of the Performing Arts Center had a couple of greenhouse homes for 10 elders? Because then, like, if, if they're... If, they, if they're people who dig theater or art, they can go downstairs, catch a show, and go back upstairs like without the hubbub. So really kind of, that kind of creative creativity only comes from community efforts, right? No organizations are gonna try and do that. Um, but I think that there's a lot of possibility within this model to not just create community, but to um, capitalize on great niches where there is existing relationship. Um, particularly in some of those old buildings, if you looked at creating a retrofit greenhouse, but also maybe having a retrofit greenhouse for, for people to live in with their families, so that you can kind of look at incumbent staffing aligned with creation of homes, I just think the creativity within this is pretty endless. Thank you. I know. I don't know time either, so. Okay. That's okay. Um, hi, my name is Cheryl Good. Now I have the privilege of working for the chairwoman in Trenton. Um, in the committee work we do, I uh, also have a background in housing. So my question I'm hoping is appropriate. If not, another person can certainly engage on this. The question's about density. So um, this is a fascinating approach, but obviously we have a fairly urgent need in our state. And from talking to uh, people who are traditional operators, one of the challenges is that in dense environments, we have more staff, but staff costs. And for, coming from Arnold Cohen um, from the Housing Community Development Network, talked about how in those environments, it's extremely difficult to pay people appropriately to work in the homes. We also have cost per square foot in, um, this, I'm going somewhere with this, I'm not trying to preach. I'm with you. Uh, we also have uh, you know, places where it's easier to develop, but it's very difficult to get anyone there because though the cost per square foot is lower, we have a, um, we have a, a challenge getting people to work. Um, so there's a question, and it sounds like you've dealt with this in Rochester. There's a question of how you address the challenges of developing um, in de according to the density. Because I would imagine while you could find cost per square foot in places like you know, former cities of industry where you've seen real collapses in the manufacturing base, it's going to cost a lot of money to go through three levels of brick and to asbestos. open the open the doorway <laughs> large enough to get, uh, you know, whatever, or to get a, a, a an ADA compliant elevator in. Do you have any data or anything that addresses the question of how density impacts um, your ability to compensate and how that relates specifically to Medicaid reimbursement? It's the last part that I'm asking about. The, uh, that is a great question. I don't know, um, I don't know if we have data to support that. Um, I will tell you that in, so as an operator, one of the things that's really important to me is how do we create a model that, um, that people want to work at 
and that people can work at for their lives um, as a way that's a, it's truly a career. Um, and when I look at direct support, whether it's CNAs or direct support professionals across the nation, I, we, we want to dance around the, the fact that this is a poverty issue, um, and it's, it's not something that we're going to get away with without a compensation strategy. So I'm going to be really unpopular here for a second and say what needs to happen is we need to think about the way that we have built infrastructure expectations within deep regulation for nursing homes um, and similar providers to say, you have to have a director of social work. You have to have a director of nursing for every entity. You have to have a director of activities, and you have to have, the, stop defining people that have to have there, and start talking about the functions that have to be met, because then what you can get is really a fully operationalized staffing model that's built upon a universal worker who's trained and compensated fairly, and you can afford it, because you're taking away overhead from indirect expenses. Uh, and I know that may not be popular, but it is the reality. You need less people and you need more money in the people that are taking care of people. Hi, thank you, Angela and Rebecca. This has been a great um, forum, and, and to AARP, this has been absolutely fantastic. So we had, to the best of my knowledge, two greenhouses in New Jersey that weren't successful. And I'm wondering if the greenhouse organization has done um, an evaluation of why those communities didn't make it and what regulatory or other reforms we need in New Jersey so that if future mission-driven providers uh, want to adopt this model, they will be successful. I love that question. Do all of you know that you have two homes in New Jersey? So they are not greenhouse homes something for you to note. Uh, so this provider wanted to do something really novel, and they tried really hard, had no, and they did it early. And they had no structure, and they had no um, model of support. And so what, what I believe happened, based on talking to people within that model, is that they kept present, pre they effectively kept everything that they had in traditional organization, put it into two houses, and struggle financially and struggle with staff outcomes because the staff are not trained, are not empowered, and do not have the tools and resources or structure in order to grow. Um, so that's pure kind of uh, anecdotal stories by people who run those organizations. Um, the other thing about, the, this is the truth of the matter, is that n nursing homes um, in we've cultivated this uh, through our legislation, have really hyper risk adverse leadership. So I, again, I loved it that I could at one point say, hey, it's my license on the line. Now I'm a project coach, that's no longer the case, but I can say, look, your license isn't going anywhere, but our humanity is. So when we talk about um, what is, what's going wrong, there are also greenhouse homes that struggle across the nation. And the reason why it always comes down to this, they're not living the model in terms of investing in their direct workforce um, and onboarding, and they do not have leadership that is committed to cultivating staff empowerment. That means they don't have a quality assurance coordinator for housekeeping, dining, uh, meaningful life, scheduling. So what's happening is they're adding in additional staff to manage all of those things, and they're just recreating what we know, which is a little institution. So you can't do it. So it requires a leadership mentality. It just all starts with leadership. Uh, it requires a leadership mentality that says, oh, this is hard, and we can do it. And that's, that's my role as a project coach. Well, thank you. Rebecca, you've done an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you if you much. have any further questions for Rebecca, I know she'll be here until the rest on, of yeah. the, the program. And I want to thank you again for educating us on this very, very important topic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.